Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. The presentation is a little squished in both time and space. So it's a little squished in the screen. Uh, so hope you for forgive me or f forgive uh, whatever along the chain of devices that caused this. So today I'd like to talk about what can be predicted from the face of a driver that doesn't directly, obviously seem to be predictable from the face of a driver. So at MIT, our group's research is in designing systems, semi-autonomous systems that share control with the human being. And there's a lot of um, things there on the bottom of the screen, from green to red, on the computer vision side, on the machine learning side, that is the focus of our work in what can be detected from the face of the driver. Now the thing I'd like to focus on today is glances is gaze estimation, gaze classification. But as opposed to looking at just where a driver's glance is, we want to look at what that glance implies about the external environment. First, quick note about the difference here. It's a very subtle but crucial point about uh, the difference between gaze estimation and gaze classification. Estimation, traditionally, 20, 30 years of work now, really, head pose estimation, eye pose estimation, is the geometric problem of locating features on the face and mapping them onto a 3D model of uh, your, what you believe that head and face are shaped like, and then using that to infer the vector of the head and vector of the eyes to then infer the, where the, the gaze is directed, the XYZ position in the external world where a person is looking. There is no machine learning here. There's no learning from data. The, the learning from data aspect does come from the local, localizing the points in the face, but in terms of the geometric problem, there's no learning. On the gaze classification side is a pure machine learning problem. This is where deep learning can shine. You subdivide uh, glances into regions of where a driver is looking and classify, have human beings in a semi-automated way annotate the different regions. So one, the subtle thing I mentioned, and a crucial one, is that by watching the video on the right, you can a human being can classify, can annotate, manually annotate where the driver is looking. And that allows us to build what we currently have is 15 million image data set uh, of 500 drivers of looking around in the wild. So annotating in post. It's a crucial but very important difference that makes the rest of this presentation possible. And again, step five of this pipeline is the, is the one where machine learning can step in. The face detection, face alignment, detecting the pupil and the head, those are all uh, landmark localization problems. Uh, those are standard to the geometric approach. But classification, when you put all of that, the raw pixels of the face and everything else together in into CNN to predict one of the six regions in this case, that makes it a machine learning problem, which means you learn from data, which means you can cover a lot of the crazy edge cases that happen in the wild. And those edge cases are occlusions, one of the biggest problems in driving. Lighting variations, also huge. Full, uh, full light-based occlusions, just uh, moving out of frame, partial light occlusions of the various features of the face. And so what this allows us to do, the classification approach, is to um, automatically classify where a driver is looking and uh, automatically classify where the driver is looking and only go to the human being for when uh, the, the classifier is uncertain. And that allows us to reduce uh, 80 to 100 fold the amount of uh, work that a human being needs to do in manual annotating all of this. Okay, so why is this important? We want to convert uh, large-scale naturalistic data of the kind I'll talk about today and the kind we're aggressively collecting in, uh, at MIT in mostly Tesla vehicles at this point. Uh, we want to convert that into three things. One, understanding of what drivers actually do, where they look around, what, where their body goes in, in the car during autonomous driving and during fully manual driving. Then we want to design systems, real-time systems, of the kind I'll talk about in a little bit here, that uh, take that behavior and in real time assist the driver in sharing control or in coaching the driver how to behave more uh, safely. And then finally, shared autonomy. L2, L3 towards L4 automation of the vehicles. 
So when the driver is incapable of controlling the vehicle, the vehicle will be able to take control from the driver to keep them safe. Now, again, from the face, the traditional thing you want to look at is where the driver is looking. It's a big focus for us. And we can get all the various forms of distractions from the face. And there's a lot of types of distractions, texting, grooming, eating, singing, watching videos, and so on. And those are a source of um, major injuries and fatalities in driving today. So this is the traditional thing in one of our Tesla vehicles. Uh, in real time, the driver's uh, uh, gaze is being classified into one of six regions. In the instrument cluster, left, right, road, rear view mirror, or the center stack. This is the machine learning problem I mentioned, as opposed to the geometric head pose, eye pose estimation problem. Again, another, just like any other classification problem, we can look at frustration. A binary classification problem of frustrated or not frustrated drivers. Now, flipping that onto the external world, the machine perspective, the perspective, the standard slam, the uh, localization mapping problem, the scene understanding, the segmenting the scene of various object detection, the computer vision problem of determining everything in your environment, and then planning your movement in a, a short-term and long-term way, so control and planning through that environment. That's what a car does. And this is a lot of our work is in this. So on the top left is a deep reinforcement learning approach to trajectory planning. On the top right is uh, full scene segmentation. On the bottom is something we're doing a lot of now is end-to-end -end learning of the driving task. From the raw video, this is in a, one of our Teslas, to generating the control of the vehicle uh, with a neural network end-to-end. -end. Quick plug, if this talk is super boring, uh, this, the, 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 the competition I mentioned is uh, now over 10,000 submissions. We're running this, cars.mit.edu. So search deep traffic on Google. Uh, you get to win a, a lot of big prizes. Back to the driver. Uh, the question is whether from the face of the driver, the kind of stuff I showed in the previous slide, this kind of, uh, the external environment, whether the face of the driver can tell us something about this world, the external world. Whether this, the glances, the glance regions through time, the temporal dynamics of glance regions, can tell us something about the external environment. So what is the data set we're working with? Uh, time is in the y-axis going down, and uh, the six, uh, six second periods of time of different glances through time. So forward roadway, instrument cluster, forward roadway, forward roadway, so on at, uh, uh, 30 frames a second. So the, for this particular paper, the, uh, the data set we use is called the 100 car study. It's one of the original naturalistic large scale studies. It has approximately 2 million vehicle miles, almost 43,000 hours of data, uh, 241 drivers. And uh, six, there's been selected 5,000 six second epics of time periods of time where a lot of different things were annotated, human annotated, uh, so it's double annotated and mediated for various variables in three categories, the driving environment, uh, driver demographics, and driver state and behavior. The driving environment variables are things like proximity to the intersection, lighting, is it daylight, is it evening, uh, traffic signs, locality, so rural, interstate, city, traffic density, surface condition, dry or wet, weather, uh, the, uh, the number of travel lanes, or the presence of a traffic divider, seat belt. So all of these things were annotated on a frame by frame, so 30 frames a second basis for those 5,000 epics. Also, driver demographics, so age in three categories, uh, with 23 and a half and 40 and a half years old being the thresholds uh, for young, middle-aged and uh, older. And gender, female, male, and then driver state, the obvious thing to get from the face is a behavior like following too closely, failed to signal, and so on, and distraction, adjusting the radio, fatigue, talking, uh, and so on. So quick, uh, I, quick thing that the approach of this paper has taken is said, when we look at the sequence of glances, those discrete regions, what can we predict? What is the data that we're working with? We're looking at the temporal dynamics of those glances in a six second period. And what's being shown here is a transition diagram. On the, on the y-axis 
is what you're transitioning from, and the x-axis is what you're transitioning to. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight regions of where a driver is looking. Rear view mirror, center stack, eyes closed, uh, interior object, right, forward, instrument cluster, and left. So those are the, the values for the variable that we're looking through in time. And we put that into an HMM, and the task is to predict the difference between the left side and the right side. On the left, in this particular example, is the, the non-distracted class, and on the right is the adjusting the radio class. And there are subtle variations between those transition matrices highlighted in this way, red and blue being shown as the difference between the two transition matrices. So the machine learning task here is to pull out that difference on the right. So how well can we do this? How well can we predict from the driver's face, from the driver's glances, things that are not immediately related to that glance? So obviously on the bottom here, the highest accuracy of 80 percentile is stuff that's related to glance, at least somewhat. Distraction, uh, adjusting the radio, and so on. And as you move up um, this, this table, you go into the environment, you're still able to predict at 60 percent accuracy plus things that are, don't seem to be immediately at all related to glances, such as proximity to intersection, the light, uh, lighting, day versus night without light, uh, traffic light presence, locality, city versus rural, age, uh, middle age versus older adults. And there's a difference in the way people look around. And then moving up in worse and worse accuracy across those variables that were annotated, so things uh, like gender, male versus female, become very difficult to predict based on the way you look around. And finally, the worst is being able to predict weather and uh, behavior, such as speeding, going above the speed limit. Uh, apparently, you don't look around differently when you're speeding. So uh, why is this interesting? Why is this important? First, uh, the sort of behavioral uh, philosophical insight here is that the, the eyes the way you look around communicates some information about uh, the external environment. So the way you move your eyes is different uh, based on the external environment. But also, you can use this information as a sort of sensor to uh, support the external facing sensors of LiDAR, radar, and camera to support the kind of things that we're doing on the bottom. So internal sensing supports the external sensing. And finally, that means we can run this kind of uh, multimodal prediction of the external scene on large scale data. I, uh, and we're doing just that. We have 18 Teslas driving around now with uh, over 6,000 hours studying semi-autonomous driving uh, with over 2 billion video frames of the kind that I mentioned already collected of the face. This is a quick highlight of a road trip to Florida and we have thousands more like it. Um, so. With that, I'd like to end and mention that if you would like to find out what's up with the thing on the top right and what's up with the cat dressed as a monkey eating a banana on the bottom left, you want to go to selfdrivingcars.mit.edu. And I will, not, I will not give you hints in the question and answer session. All right, thanks very much, guys. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the movement of our eyes and head is one of the only things the driver can control. And so those are direct reflecting, they directly reflect everything in the environment. So sort of the human behavior for the majority in driving is controlled by the head and the eyes and hand position. So hands on steering wheel, hands not. And so those are the only variables we get to play with. And, oh, sorry, and one that's often not talked about but is really critical is the position of the foot, uh, which we have very little data on. Um, in fact, they talk about just real quick in terms of 
uh, what is the most powerful way to indicate stress of a driver. And we talk to people that teach teenagers to drive, and it's the way the, the, the distance of hovering above this, the accelerometer pedal for their foot. So the foot is the strongest indication of, the foot is the window to the soul when it comes to the driver, I guess. Hi, Shamsi Iqbal, Microsoft Research. This is an excellent presentation, really enjoyed it. Uh, typically we think about kind of like using your external environment to predict user effect, so it's good to see that you've kind of like flipped it around and using the user effect and the case position to predict what's going on. So have you thought about how you're going to use this maybe in practice? So, uh, and you, you mentioned a little bit on your slides, but I mean, what do you think, say, five years from now, how is something, a car company like Tesla going to use this information? Uh, it's a great question. Thank you. Uh, so, first of all, uh, a, a little bit of this is kind of fun. I think the most important thing we look at is where the driver is looking, whether their eyes are on the road or not. That's what's important for safety. Ability to predict proximity to intersection based on the way you look around, I would argue is in the category of studying human behavior and fun as opposed to uh, we can predict proximity to intersection with many other sensors, GPS and, and camera and LIDAR, every other sensor. But I think what's really important here is uh, getting an understanding of the movement of eyes. So eyes is the way we take in information. And if the movement of eyes changes, depending on the environment, that means we need to understand it in order to control the, the where people look so that we make sure their eyes are on the road when there's something dangerous going on. I would also kind of like love to see if you look at how people do this with distracted dr drivers. So people who are doing something else in a semi-autonomous vehicle and so how their eye gaze movements change from someone who's focusing on the road. Yeah, absolutely. So there's two things. One is uh, semi-autonomous driving, things change a lot uh, in the Tesla. But also in the modern world, things have changed a lot even from the, this data set is smartphones. Uh, even manually controlled vehicles, smartphones are there's a lot of people that drive in our data set that simply drive like this. They're texting and driving the whole time. They're holding their phone the whole time. Uh, so it changes everything about your interaction. And also pedestrians, we look at uh, gaze patterns of pedestrians, also changes completely with the smartphone. There's, uh, you often cross the, the street while holding your phone and looking down at it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Cindy Harnett, University of Louisville. Uh, when we're thinking about eyes, they're focusing on something. Do you see any analogy in the world of sensors that we need to um, replicate? In the world of sensors, the what? That we need to, um, is, are there any lessons that you can draw from where the people are looking as to where the sensors should be looking? Sensor position? You think, or just sensor, just uh, Sensor attention. <laughs> attentional mechanism of sensors. Mm -hmm. um, something we play around a lot when you're on networks, but, um, oh boy. Uh, you know, with everything we get with attention, um, that I've seen at least, eyes on road or eyes off road is the only thing that matters. Uh, uh, so, th the pattern is, um, It's a really excellent question. I think I basically don't have a good answer about uh, what, how to construct better sensors based on this information. I think you need to have sensors that just stare at the road, right. and like cameras do, right? right. So. That was a very open question. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Thanks very much. I appreciate it.